So, um, I'll talk a little about zonation, this, that, this uh, software capable of doing all of that, like choosing what are the priority areas for conservation, excluding areas that are not useful for achieving targets, including costs, trying to find balanced solutions that uh, will try to balance competing interests, and, and trying to achieve this kind of target. So you see that zonations, it's a kind of different, so it's a kind of different problem in conservation than the two others I previously presented to you. But I'll get to that. We don't have targets in zonations, not, not working. Okay. So zonation is a conservation software developed by um, my friend Ate Moilani and his group in the University of Helsinki in Finland. Uh, these guys are doing a great job in trying to <clears throat> get this software used as for most people as possible. What does zonation do, actually? So, it, as any other conservation planning software, it produces a map of priorities. It gives you what are the best places to allocate your finite resources for taking a given conservation action. So <clears throat> there is some differences. The nation produced some kind of hierarchical zoning of a landscape looking for priority sites for conservation. It means that you have all this place. This is an example that comes with the nation, so the Hunter Valley in Australia. You have the whole region being prioritized. So you don't necessarily have this is priority, this is not priority. What it will give you is some kind, this place is top priority, then is, this is priority, and this is less priority, and this is no priority. Okay, you have kind of a surface of priority that you can see, and you have some kind of rank. This is a, the top fraction of the landscape that will give you the most beneficial um, the, the, the greater return in conservation you can have. So if you were to protect, for example, 2% of this uh, region, you should go to the red places. And all those red places will uh, comprise 2% of the region. If you want to protect 25% of the region, then you should go from red to yellow. And that will uh, sum up 25% of the region, okay? Then, of course, is zonation has a clear workflow. Workflow works like this. You, have, you need to set your objectives, what, is, what exactly are your goals, and what are you trying to protect, what are you doing. Then you have those, these uh, <clears throat> stage of data preparation. It is preparing your ecological models, collecting data, uh, making all the things, uh, uh, building input data to, to zonation, defining what are the weights they're using for a species, for example, if this species is threatened or not, I, I, will you consider that or not, you should to, to do that. Then process all of the data, that means building input data, you'll see that zonation is very, it could be very time consuming to put all the data together in a way that zonation can read actually, the data. Then you go to the computational analysis by itself, doing this spatial prioritization. And what you get from this spatial prioritization is basically two types of outputs. You first have this map of priorities. This is a priority rank map, just what I just explained to you. You have uh, places with high importance for conservation, high conservation value. Uh, areas and places with low conservation areas. And you also have this other output file that is uh, some performance occurs and you can measure the actual benefit you're getting for that action. It is usually uh, indicated in a map like this. So you have the proportion of landscape under conservation from 100% of the landscape is protected to zero landscape protected. And then you can look at your features, for example, this one, and you see that the level of protection, that is the, the proportion of the distributions remaining 
in the landscape that you are protecting, they will decrease, of course. So when you have 100% of the place protected, you are getting all the distribution of the species. And if you have nothing, you're getting nothing. And if you're protecting, for example, half of the area, then you have, in that case, something about 90% uh, of the species is protected in that uh, half area. You get it? So this is a very interesting output because you can see it for different targets at the same time, what is happening for each of your targets, how are they responding to the level of protection you have set. You usually um, have a, a proportion of the area that you were interested in conserving, like 10% of the area, 10% of Cape Town, 20% uh, of Madagascar, or 6% of Madagascar, and then you can look at where this proportion is here and what is the amount of distribution remaining or benefit you're getting for that proportion of area protected, okay? This is the typical second output of sonation. Then, of course, you can get this uh, information that sonation uh, has as an output, and you, you can go to some kind of post-processing. You can do these maps in G, using GIS softwares like QGIS or ArcGIS, Jump, anything like that. Uh, you can do those graphs using R or Excel if you want. Then you, you verify if the results make sense, of course, if, you're, if they're responding as you expected. Take a look at the benefits and advantages and threats you can have in this particular uh, plan. Then make some recommendations that should have some on the ground quality verifications. This should take a look at the areas that you were saying that is important, they are actually important. If you have, uh, if it is actually a natural area or you have any other type of land use there, for example. And you should monitor to being set in new objectives from time to time. That is the basic workflow of the conservation planning uh, process. Well, in that process, of course, you can have some components that you were looking for, like what are your objectives or what is the occurrence of the data you have. And you have different uh, types of scenarios that just like our friend was telling them. So the best case scenario, for example, for objectives, is that they are clear, quantitative, and measurable. I know what my objective is. I know what the goals are. I can have some particular targets for their species, and I can measure that. This is one of the most important things, because if you cannot measure the real benefit of the action that you are taking, you cannot know if that action is the best action you should take. Okay? You should be able to measure the real benefit you're getting with this, with this action. But, but that is the best case, the ideal thing. The typical case is that sometimes you have that objective uh, defined, but for different purposes. So you can define it for setting some area for conservation, and the other part involved will like that area will be used for logging, for example. Or you can measure some part of it, but not, but not all of it. You don't have good data to actually tell me what is the proportion of the species that I'm protecting in this place, because you actually don't know where the, space, this, the, the species is. Okay? So that will be more the, the typical case. For example, uh, you can have some uh, accuracy in your data, but the typical case would be that you have bias within your data sets. And you have to do uh, data cleaning, you have to be careful about the data you are using, because if you have uh, very biased data, then you will get a very biased solution. Okay? The program is just, the input data is driving the solutions you have. So it's something like if data is not good, you have something like garbage in, garbage out. Data is not good, the solution is not good. 
okay, if you don't have information. The worst case scenario will be uh, uh, you have your objectives that are not clear, poorly measurable, <clears throat> you don't know how to measure if you are actually getting uh, what you want, and you don't have good data or you, you don't have the information about how data they good are. That will be another problem. Then, in the spatial prioritization by itself, in the best case scenario, of course, you have human and computational resources that are adequate to do that. So you have the right people, you have good computers, you have good software people that understands how to work with it. That will be <coughs> the, the best case. Typical case will be that you have some human resources available working in different uh, places and agencies, but you actually require collaboration. You need to bring someone to help you to, to do that. And perhaps you have some computational resources available, but they are not the best, so you can restrict the analysis. This is not necessarily the case of zonation. It's a very a light software can run in personal computers without a problem. That could be a problem. If, uh, for example, you don't have analysts to do the work, or you really lack computing resources, this could be a problem because you can't run uh, the analysis. But most of the time, it will be very related to the amount of data and good data you have to do the job. Okay, and then. Thinking about those stages you have when you're doing the prioritization, in the prioritization process, you can think that when you're doing this kind of thing, if data is ready, I mean, you have the data and it's readable, accessible, and you can use it, you should expect some around 30% of your time just to prepare the data, just to prepare the ecological model, and check the data, data cleaning, look at the quality of the data, and make an input data to run in the software. And then acquisition and preparation of data should take a more, 15% uh, more. So it's about half of your time while, when doing that will be related to data collection and data preparation, okay? That could be very time consuming. If data is not, ready, not available for use, then you should expect about 90% of your time will be compiling data. Get the data, where is the data, um, the whom should I speak with, um, how can I uh, prepare the data to work with the program so the program can read the files, I'm, I'm the input files I have. This can be the worst part of planning the most difficult one, the most time-consuming one. Then running the analysis is actually pretty fast. You just have to, once you have all the data, running the software and trying different scenarios and different solutions should be fast, as well as interpreting the results. And then you need to communicate it. And that's the other thing that takes really takes time, okay? Could be communicating it by writing a scientific paper or having a meeting with some, some, someone from the environmental ministry. You should have spend some time in that. But the message here is if you're actually will be willing to use this kind of tool to develop conservation priorities, you should be prepared to spend a lot of your time preparing the data, collecting data, uh, doing data mining, cleaning, and stuff like that, okay? So, <clears throat> what are the input files of Zonation? Zonation works, it, it was developed to work with large grids. So we're talking about raster files with uh, many, many planning units or grid cells, okay? The thing is that these raster files, they should be all uh, the format of the files should be the same. So, if you're entering, for example, species data, it could be presence, absence of species, okay? It could be the abundance of a given species you're working, it could be a cost layer, it could be a mask layer in which you include the protected areas or not. All of that in zonation 
would be read as an ASC file. That's a raster file, text file for each feature you have. And all of them look the same. You have this head in here that doesn't change for the file. It says what is the number of columns and rows you have. And all the raster files should be uh, that way. Okay? Even if you have a species with that small distribution and a species with a large distribution, the size of the distribution should be included within the raster file. But you don't have different raster files for species. You don't have a raster file with 100 columns and 60 rows for one species and another raster file with 649 and 50, uh, 55 rows for a species. All raster files should be of the same size. Okay? Got this? This is one of the most important things because if you have different raster files with different headings, so nature will simply will not read the file. It will say to you that is a mismatch between, between uh, among raster files and he cannot process any data. <clears throat> so this raster file should look like this. You have a number of columns and rows that is the same from all rasters you're using. You have the X and Y corner that's actually the same. The cell size, it could be in kilometers, degrees, anything like that, but all rasters should be uh, at the same resolution and have the same information in the heading. And then you, you would need to inform what is no data value. So you have a region that you, you, were, you were doing a conservation planning for, and you have the outside of that region. There should be no data. It means that it is not part of your plan. It doesn't mean there's an absence there. It means that it is not part of your plan or that you don't really have data for that particular grid cell. Okay? That will be the difference, for example, if you're using real presence absence data, then you have what is outside of your planning region would be negative 9999. What is inside your planning region will be either zero, because the species is not there, or one if the species is there, okay? But if you're using, uh, if you're not using real presence absence, if you just have point locality data and you just have where the species is present, then uh, within your planning region, where the species is present, it should be one, and the place in, in which you don't, for which you don't have data, it is not zero, okay? Because zero is an information, but you don't have information for that cell. So it should be negative 9999. But <clears> other <throat> than this, all raster files will have the same head here, which is the same for all of them, and then the information contact. And you should have a raster file for each feature you're using. So if you're doing some kind of planning for 600 species, you will have 600 raster files like this, one raster for each species you're working with. One raster for cost, one raster for uh, the mask layer, okay? One raster for any other competing land use. <clears throat> then you could also have some species-specific uncertainty maps. For example, if you have model species distribution uh, using any kind of modeling technique, then you have uh, an uncertainty associated with that. You also need to have a raster file with the uncertainty of the distribution of each species. So again, if you're working with six, 600 species that, whose distribution were modeled by you, then you can have another 600 raster files, each file for each species with the uncertainty level of your information. Okay? You have, for example, that could be 0 0.78. This is like the suitability value of that cell for the species. And then have another raster file that cell for that cell, your uncertainty is something like 0 0.15. Okay? One file is linked to the another because it is the same species, and one 
have the information about the habitat suitability and the other has the information about the uncertainty level of the information on habitat suitability. You could do some species specific connectivity specification. This would not necessarily require, uh, require a raster file. You can change some parameters in the model, get to there. And if you don't have the actual distribution of the species, you could also use some point distribution data. If you have some, a particular species that is important but is very rare, for example, so you just have about five or six points uh, 